So I think that that fatty liver disease is a key component of the whole thing. It's not part of the, the metabolic syndrome, but it goes along with. Uh, okay, so now you have this liver with all this packed fat. You've made all these new fat, these triglycerides. So what happens to that mm -hmm. in the liver? Yeah. yeah, well, if insulin's up, insulin is going to stimulate the um, fat cells to activate an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. And so if we sort of continue the journey, the elevated insulin and the sufficient fuel is making the liver fat and it's making the liver share that fat, which in and of itself isn't a bad thing. But in the presence of chronically elevated insulin, you can't burn it. You're forcing the body just to continue to store it. And the fat cells now with the high insulin telling it, it's basically the, the insulin is basically telling the fat cell, hey, there's going to be some buses, some school buses of some fatty little children coming by <laughs> and I need you to pull them in. And that is what the lipoprotein lipase is doing. So when lipoprotein lipase gets stimulated by insulin, now when all of these triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, these fatty-loaded lipoproteins are coming by, the fat cells are pulling it in. And they're pulling it in as individual fatty acids, but in the, in the same presence of that elevated insulin, that fat cell itself is going to start storing more of that fat and basically joining it back in to a stored form of fat, which is the triglycerides. But as people like to um, focus only on that aspect and they will say, well, that's the only way fat cells get big by circulating fat. And that is absolutely not true. Um, that even that same kind of glucose stimulus that those glucose carbon building blocks that the liver was using to create fat, the fat cell can as well. Now, some of the confusion has come where you have influencers, influencers who are saying this sort of idea that the glucose isn't a, a building block for the fat cell to create fat. It's because they're looking at studies that were only looking at enlarged fat cells. It appears to be this sort of shift where the smaller the fat cell, the more it is able to be pulling in the glucose and turning it into fat. And so it does that very, very well. So that same glucose that's making the liver fat can also be making the smaller fat cells fat. In contrast, when the fat cell starts to get bigger, then it is primarily a function of just pulling the fat in. The glucose is a much more modest contributor to an already enlarged fat cell. And that itself might be a reflection of the insulin resistance that can happen at fat cells. And, and that sort of brings us back to that fifth and final part of the metabolic syndrome, which is the obesity aspect, where insulin will not only, so as the, as the fat cells get bigger and bigger, um, so there, maybe I'll stay, take one step back where the, the, the listeners may be interested to know that humans can get fat through two different processes. We can get fat or uh, two different people could be gaining the same 10 pounds of fat. So they've each gained two college roommates. They were buddies in college. They get back together 10 years later for a reunion. They've both gained 10 pounds. In fact, more likely it would be 20 pounds, but let's just go with 10. <laughs> and, and one of them is just a little chubbier, but he's doing fine. He, he's still generally healthy. His blood pressure is normal. He doesn't have any other sort of signs of the metabolic syndrome. Whereas his roommate, who also gained 10 pounds of fat, he is now type 2 diabetic he has fatty liver disease, he has hypertension. What could explain it is very likely how they gained that 10 pounds of fat. So more important than the mass of fat that someone gains, it's the size of their fat cells. And there's, there's some interesting ethnic sh shifts here. Like one of the reasons I did my fellowship in Singapore was because the government of Singapore was interested in why Europeans and Chinese Singaporeans had such differing propensity for metabolic problems at such different body fat levels. So let's say the one roommate who gained the 10 pounds and was still healthy, let's say he's sort of a typical kind of European Caucasian guy, but his roommate was a sort of Chinese, typical kind of Chinese ethnicity guy. They've each gained 10 pounds. And these two ethnicities tend to be on the far ends of the spectrum where Caucasians tend to have a little more ability to make new fat cells. And so this guy gained fat and yet he has more fat cells, but they're all still a little more modestly sized. So they're generally relatively small. And small fat cells still have a lot of room to grow. And so they are still sensitive to insulin because insulin wants fat cells to grow. It wants everything to grow. 
And but when the fat cell starts to reach a point of maximum dimension, it must start to limit its growth, lest it literally pop, which will be a very messy where, where the membrane of the cell cannot hold on to its size anymore. It's the water balloon that's getting overfilled and it's about to burst. That tends to be, say, the other roommate where in his body, he has a very limited capacity to make fat cells. In fact, he's made them already in there. He's not making more. This is actually is how most people get fat across all ethnicities. Um, but now his fat gain is happening because each of his fat cells is getting really big. That's called hypertrophy as opposed to hyperplasia where the fat cells are multi multiplying. And the larger the fat cell gets, the mo two things happen that create a particularly problematic metabolic scenario. One, it becomes insulin resistant. So now rather than um, it, it, it still is taking in fat, although it's not taking in glucose as much, that aspect has become a little resistant, but it's not a, it's not a universal phenomenon. A cell can manifest with selective insulin resistance where some things aren't listening to insulin anymore, but some things still are. So the hypertrophic fat cell can still take in fat, but its insulin resistance is manifested by it's also leaking out fat. Insulin can no longer force the fat cell to hold on to the fat. And so as much as it's still force feeding some fat in, it's now also letting some fat out. And that creates this phenomenon referred to as ectopic lipid deposition, or the body's now storing fat where it shouldn't be storing it, including in the liver or the muscles or the kidneys, where there's high levels of fat in the blood, these free fatty acids. Normally, the body would burn those. But if insulin is up, it has to store it. It can't burn it. And so we start storing all of that fat in all kinds of places that aren't suitable for long-term fat storage. So the fat cell becomes insulin resistant to try to restrict its growth. But then second, which compounds this problem throughout the entire body, the overfilled fat cell starts to get it starts to push itself and its neighboring fat cells further and further away from capillaries from and the life-giving blood because cells need to be within just a few micrometers of a, a capillary in order to get all the oxygen that it needs and give off its CO2 and other metabolites. But the fat cell can expand to 300 or 400 micrometers, which is well over 10 times the distance that it should be from a capillary. And thus it starts to suffocate or at the level of the cell, we would use the word hypoxic. It becomes hypoxic. Interestingly, one way the hypertrophic fat cell can correct the blood flow is flushing the system with pro-inflammatory cytokines, these pro-inflammatory proteins because some of them act like a trail of breadcrumbs and, and then the capillaries will say, oh, okay, there's some cells over here I need to grow out to. So it will stimulate the synthesis of new blood vessels to try to correct the hypoxia. The tragedy here is that these two things that the hypertrophic fat cell has done to ensure its own survival, namely become insulin resistant to stop growth, become very inflammatory to correct the blood flow deficiency, also happen to compound and exacerbate the metabolic problem throughout the entire body. As, as mentioned, now we're storing fat in all kinds of unsuitable places. And second, we've activated these immune pathways, which in their own right are capable of causing insulin resistance. So the body suffers all for the sake of the fat cells trying to survive. That's fascinating. I mean, it really explains a lot about sort of what's been happening in the world, really, uh, but also the differences with the uh, different ethnicities, because we, we see this actually clinically a lot where you, you might have uh, usually a Caucasian who's, you know, quite overweight mm -hmm. and not diabetic in the least. Yep. Yep. And on the flip side, you have some you know, Chinese or Indian person. I actually yep. have a lot of Indians who are like this too. Yes. And their BMI is like 24 and they've got terrible diabetes. They're getting heart disease. Yeah. Very young. The skinny fat, the skinny, the skinny fat phenotype. Fat, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it really explains a lot about that. So, you know, I think that that's really important. Uh, you know, when we're thinking about these, uh, diseases and how to avoid them, right? Then, uh, you know, keeping in mind this sort of insulin uh, levels, insulin um, 
you know, the, the sort of key role this plays, because I think, you know, to me, this sort of insulin versus calories debate is not a real debate because they work really at different, like completely different levels, right? Like, obviously, a calorie is not a hormone, like it's just a, it's just a measure of energy. You know, if you have carbohydrates versus proteins versus fats, they have different hormonal responses, right? Insulin is a hormone. So it has completely different, like the, you can't compare them, no. right? On the one hand, that there's an overlap because if you're eating more calories, if the diet is fixed, then you're going to have more hormonal effect, right? So there's always an overlap and that's where the confusion comes. But I think you've done a great job in trying, you know, and really pinpointing sort of what the important, um, aspects of chronic disease are you know in the in the 21st century i mean this is really what we need to focus on because it's just not like uh, heart disease cardiovascular disease and cancer like are the two biggest killers of americans like by a long shot right